I hope I didn't put anything too important on the right hand side of the screen there that won't be visible, but hopefully we can work around that. Because I'm an engineer, I think I've always been a map person and some of the research we do on projects looking into the past uses of the land we might be proposing on. It's important to understand what was there and that type of thing. So I'm going to run through. Okay, I'm going to walk through a lot of different options we have and maps that we can use in our research. And I'll start with a pretty broad view. I'm happy to answer questions about where any of these things came from. And I hope I'll be explaining that as we go along. So let me just start with something that goes back quite a ways. You know, maps are certainly works of art, right? Look at the work that goes into this type of thing. This uh, came from 1685 and it's a Dutch map. I remember years ago, I went to a lecture at Historic Deerfield and it was that kind of lecture where someone stands at the podium and presents their paper, which is not my favorite way to do this. I, I much prefer having an interactive presentation. But something that was said that day really stuck in my mind because it's, it's very important to understand why was a map made. Just the same way that we look at all kinds of documents when we do historical research. You wanna know why was it made? Why was it kept? Who made this? We need to understand the motivation before we can uh, understand how we should be using it. So one thing that came out of that discussion that night was the different outlooks from map, maker, ma map makers during colonial period between say the Dutch, the Spanish and the English because the Dutch were traders, right? So they were here very early trading with the natives and building their wealth that way. Even though there were Dutch settlements at different times in different places, one of their primary objectives was commerce, right? So if you look at this kind of map, where's my little pointer? Oh, yesterday I had red. So they're acknowledging the wildlife over here. They're showing us what some native settlements might look like because they needed to work with those people to get what they came for, to understand what resources were available. And they also put this wonderful engraving here so we can see what a landscape might have looked like. And I'm sure this is the type of thing with some color that, that people could have hung on their wall. There's another critter over here. So they were aware of what was happening. They knew they had to get inland in order to get some of those products they were looking for. So the perspective of this map is uh, the way the Dutch would have been looking at what they wanted to know about this new world. I pulled this one out of the Library of Congress as an old Spanish map. This is from 1670, same general time frame. Obviously all in Spanish, but there's a whole lot of description on there. Now the Spanish, in addition to looking for the fountain of youth, right, or, or all kinds of gold, they were also looking to convert the natives. So they were much more interested in where were the people located in addition to where were the resources located. So I haven't tried to translate a lot of these notes, but that's part of the objective of this map is to understand what's going on mapping the coastline, but also how they might interact with the people. All right, on to the English. It's very English, isn't it? To see that title block, the English Empire in North America. Whether or not it actually belonged to them at the time, they're seeing this as empire. So they're looking for a place to send people they're outgrowing their little island. They're looking for resources. They're looking for uh, products, but they're also looking for a place they can settle 
and conquer because empire is a very British word, isn't it? So just that concept to start off as to how different map makers might have been looking at the maps. Again, why did they make the maps? And you can see this takes us from uh, Labrador, Newfoundland, all the way down the coast of Florida. This is that 1685 with a blow up of the Cape Cod area. Should I share? That's where I am right now. Beautiful day. Beautiful day in Holyoke as well, right? So it's important to take a look at maps that represent the period we may be researching. Because not only do political boundaries change over time, but physically the land changes. And because Cape Cod is a big sand dune, a sandbar, we can take a look at how it's changed over time as it was mapped by people in different eras. So here's a 1685. Here's a, I might lose that one off the side. Here's a little later map. You can see it's got a more angular shape. And this one's a little silly, but it does describe what was happening, right? This is, I thought I had a date, I don't see it. But we do see the road network. And we see the coastline here if we look a little closer. So it has a sense of humor, but it's also giving us an idea of what was important here in that time period. Another category we might want to get into would be nautical maps. And this one is giving you the depth of the water because the purpose of this map would be to make sure you don't damage your ship, right? That you go through the right canal. And you want to travel safely. And this one also has some notations on uh, what you'll find on the land side of the coast. And, and here's a note there that's in the middle. It says Barnstable Bay is not dangerous by reason of so many flats. And you won't run ashore because you can get off again. Those aren't exactly the words, but that's what it says. So this is letting you know that the, the water will come back in the after low tide in the bay and your ship will float again. So this would be directed at sailors, explorers. Just staying with the Cape Cod theme for one more minute. I just love this map. I'm sorry. This is Champlain's map. Now oh, it's at the top. That's what it is. So if you can imagine these sailing ships in the Nauset March, just around the corner from the National Park Service in East Ham. This is much marshier now. Can't imagine ships going through there, little fishing boats maybe. But this gives you an idea of the native settlements. Looks pretty permanent, doesn't it? We have gardens, we have fences around our gardens, we have smoke coming out of the chimney here or the opening in the top. So this is a snapshot in time in the 1600s with a key in French, marking here we have the um, low areas. We have dunes. So this is just gorgeous to be such an early map from very early exploration. And it, again, reminds us how the coastline changes, how things fill in and then get deeper. So I love that because it gives you an idea of the, the native village there. Okay, let's move inland. This is the western side of Massachusetts. This is a 1755 map. 
And it shows us that settlement was happening up the Connecticut River, right? So at this point, settlement was driven by the water route. Nobody really wanted to cross all this land. And the danger that would be there between the shore and the Connecticut River. So this shows us as we come up the river, Enfield, Springfield, Hadley, Deerfield, all the fields. And it gives us an idea of where people were during that period of time. It also shows us that there were different names. The Miller's River was called Papaguntaquash. Um, Apple was called, uh, I don't want to say it wrong, but it was Pequog? No, something close to that. I'd have to zoom in a little more. You don't want to see my nose so closely on your screen. Ipswich, Canada, Dorchester, Canada. Not Canada, but grants from soldiers from those Eastern Massachusetts towns. This one is Narragansett number four. So when we're doing research, whether it's about our family or another topic, we want to try to find something that fits in the time frame that we're looking at, because those are the references we'll find. I found at the Mass Archives a report of one of my ancestors who was scouting in the area here, and it discusses seeing Manadnock in the distance, and they went from here to there to there and didn't find any sign of the Indians. But when you have a map that has the names on it that they would refer to it at the time, it makes a big difference. When we're dealing with New England maps, we don't look at that same system they have in the Midwest where everything is nice and square and corners and norths and souths and east and west. However, you do sometimes find rectangles when we go back to the original grants. This is where I live in the town of Irving, Miller's River on the south. And this was granted to Lord Irving who mapped it in numbered rectangles so it could be transferred because a lot of these original proprietors or, or grantees didn't have any intention of using that land. It was just a financial pass through, right? So you may find when you're looking at deeds, and we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks in the next talk, you may find reference to these old lot numbers. So you have to go way back. Here we have 1788. I've seen various lots numbered the same way in Vermont and other towns. This is Wendell on the other side of the river. And this gives you an idea of how it was laid out. 400 acres sold to David Osgood. And the rest was still theoretically up for sale, right? Same general shape here of Irving with the Mil Miller's River on the south. But over time, Orange and Irving became two separate towns. So it's very important when we're doing research to understand where the boundaries of the location were when our people were there. Because records are generally kept where they were created. And if a portion of the town was cut off, the records that go with that little piece don't necessarily go to another town clerk or another county even. So we wanna find maps that relate to the time period we're researching in. If you see this here, that indicates a marker from the Mass State Archives. That's their filing system. So if you ever see that on a map, you know that's where it's been digitized from. They've done a lot of digitizing lately. So many things we used to have to go to Columbia Point to get our online. So long description of why this map was made, the town of Orange. Lots of notes on the boundary that we could zoom in on. I mean, to some extent, it's, uh, it's interesting when we can do this type of presentation on Zoom where you can see it on your screen instead of looking at it in the library across the room. Now, granted, the screen would be bigger, but you can't always get your nose up close enough to read those notes. So 
something happened in Massachusetts in 1830. The legislature passed a resolve that each town should make a map. So this is why we have some consistent maps of that time frame that we can sort of put together like a puzzle. Okay, the city of Boston and the several towns and districts in the Commonwealth are required to make or cause to be made accurate plans of their respective towns or districts. At the same scale, 100 rods to the inch, a rod is 16 feet. I always Google that when I forget. Has to be done either already within the past five years or coming up. We don't want any old maps. Free of expense to the Commonwealth, right? So it's another unfunded mandate back in 1830. And has to be presented on or before the 1st of July of 1831. So they go on to list some of the things they wanna see. Names, courses, and magnitudes of the rivers and the smaller st streams, public and private roads, houses for public worship, courthouses, other public buildings, so we may see schools. The known and measured distance of the center of the town to the shire town of the county, the county seat. When we're looking at Irving, that would be Greenfield. And from the metropolis of the Commonwealth. So how far is it from the center of your town to Boston? We need a North Arrow. We need the boundary lines, bridges, ferries, falls, ponds, harbors, mountains, hills. So they're telling you they want to know what's happening in this town and what the resources are as well. Ironworks, furnaces, meadows, woodland. So these are, I believe, all online at the State Archives website because we used to copy them. We used to go down there and take copies when we got interested in a location, but I think you can get all of them from the website at this point. So here's an example. This is the town of Wendell. We can't go back to Holyoke. Holyoke didn't exist in 1830, right? When you have a map, always look for north. This one has north downward. So they're telling you where the magnetic pole is, but it's down. This is Wendell on the opposite side of the Millers River from that map of Irving. So we'd have to flip it over to match the other one. Here's the State Archives reference mark. And we have roads, we have woodlands. Wendell at that point, and as it is today, is not heavily populated. So not a lot of other things to show. They do have the distances here. And it, it acknowledges Irving or Irving's grant because Irving also didn't exist at that point on the north side of Wendell, which is down in this case. I like to put these two together because it shows the evolution of the maps over time. There were also quite a few maps made in 1794. So town of Montague also up in Franklin County. It's recognizable due to the shape of the river. We got the Connecticut River rolling around the side and the Millers River coming in here. In this case, North is up on the screen, but this map was made sideways. I turned it around. You can see the writing here is facing the other direction. State Archives mark. Directions of the lines. You can see there was a change, a little piece of land went away that was in Montague at the time of the first map in 1794 and not in 1830. So I'm gonna make a statement. You can tell me I'm a terrible sexist, but I look at the one on the left and I say, yeah, this is the boy that just wanted to get his homework done. The one on the right is the girl with the nice colored pencils who spent a lot of time making nice curves in the rivers. You know, somebody in your class always had more colored pencils than you did, didn't they? So little islands, 
in the river here. Here's Irving spelled with an I instead of an E, Irvins Grant. They weren't that concerned with who was their neighbor. Okay, some topography here. Looks like a hill. Looks like a hill. Green pond over here. And the main roads. They're nice and even. You can see all the crisscrossing. Now we do have down here, it's a little hard to see at this scale, but it's uh, where there are letters on the plan, they're noted in this key. We're going to see an X for a county road, I believe. And we'd have to up the contrast a little to see some of the other items. So their roads are dashed, you know, just little dots, an X for a county road, and just a few buildings. Is that the town hall would have been right in the center? Could be. And then here we have a nice neat key explanation of what we see in there. Would have been nice if I blew that up for you, wouldn't it? So these are the 1830 maps. You're going to find one for every single town in the Commonwealth. And if they are printed out to scale, you'll be able to put them together like a puzzle, which is essentially what the legislature wanted to do, right? They want to know where everything sat, where they fit together, if there was anything that, that either overlapped or wasn't claimed by anybody. And as today, the people in Boston didn't necessarily know what was happening out here in Western Mass. So they needed maps. And how did we get maps? We had people out there climbing those hills, looking through the little uh, telescope, measuring with a steel chain. Steel chain was a consistent length. They had to stretch it out from end to end to make their straight measurement. They're actually corrections for temperature because steel changes if it's very, very cold and very, very warm. So this fellow is taking his notes in his notebook. And remember that first geometry class you took? The charts in the back of the book tell you to how many decimal points you're correcting for a slope on the hill. As you're, you're holding the chain up and down, you may have to correct for the angle you're going up. Draw the map as if you're looking at it from above. So these were real people. And I think it's important to, the maps didn't just happen, right? There was no Google. There's no overhead photography. Everything that was done was measured on the ground. And as it was said in that resolve from the legislature, it had to be accurate. So you need to show you can close triangles and not lose some of that land as you're putting onto paper. Okay, this is a little nerdy, but the Borden baseline was laid out in 1831. Okay, so going along with the time frame of these maps that were made to be very accurate. It's a National Historic Civil Engineering Landmark. It was given that designation, oh gee, back in the 90s. And the plaque was installed on the lawn at the library in South Deerfield. So if you want to drive by and confirm, that's where it is. It went from Hatfield to South Deerfield. And the accuracy was one to five million. Okay, so they measured it, they measured it again, and they measured it again, they checked themselves, and they said, here are these points, you can find them up in the, the uh, set into bedrock someplace. And things could be then measured off that. So if that's fixed in space, you can then find anything within sight of that 39,000 feet of straight line, and you can measure off of it. So you know you're not wandering and tipping your map the wrong way. So this is a real thing from 1831. I hope that gave you a little bit of sense of the history. Now we're getting to a more modern era of map making. In the middle of the 1800s, the process of map making was advancing. Things could be printed off of plates and mass produced instead of, uh, well, 
the monks sitting there tracing things, but in this case, it would be more artistic people tracing maps. So when printing was revolutionized, people started producing maps for commercial use. Now you may have found a county wall map like this hanging say in a lawyer's office or in the courthouse. They're available pretty much anywhere. I've seen them, uh, Ohio's counties. So this was something that was happening at that time period and it's something that's gonna help us as genealogists or historians. In this case, Hampton County was a very linear county, kind of like my town of Irving, huh? So in order to fill up this sort of bedsheet sized map, it's about, I wanna say four by six, but don't hold me to that. In order to fill it up, they zoomed in on some of the towns. You can see that shape of Holyoke there. So you could get a little more detail. So here's the piece cut out of the top there. And as you can see, 18, what did I say, 55. Holyoke is just emerging as a city. We've got some canals happening. We've got some business. But it's not the boon we're going to find in other places because this is the map that starts to show us property owners. They went door to door. They took down people's names because they wanted to sell these maps. So you may find one in the attic of your old house, maybe rolled up on a wooden dowel. It was made of canvas and coated. Doesn't mean the mice didn't nibble on it, but there are a lot of these around. You can see the cracks in the paper. These can be found at the Library of Congress website, but it's very detailed. It's showing how the streets were laid out the canals, the factories that were being built, and even down to the islands in the river. So let me switch over to a different map of a similar time frame. This is more typical because this was an older town. We're in Connecticut. We're on a similar vintage map, 1855. And we have notations for things like sawmills. We know that Mr. Fairbanks lives here. We've got Mr. Marshall down here. But this guy snuck a little advertisement right in there. I don't know how much money he slipped the map maker. But we have the Shaker settlement down here, the Shaker store. And it tells us that fresh seeds from herbs, swifts, brooms, wholesale, at reasonable terms, are being sold by Jeffrey White. No, Jefferson White. Okay, so you really have to you have to zoom in here. You have to get your nose up to the map that's hanging on the wall. But he got a little commercial in this map. You can see here's a school noted. Little settlement at this crossroads, names of the people. So you can relate this to deeds or you can use this to look for deeds, but just the acknowledgement that where someone might be living right at the time this was made because these people were going door to door and they'd go back, they'd start engraving this on a plate backwards, right? In order to print it downwards, it had to be printed upside down. So somebody's doing all this fine lettering backwards. Then we come up a few years and we get to the Beers Atlases. Right around 1870, these atlases were published in book form because the map sellers realized that people really didn't want that huge map hanging in their pan. Uh, parlor, right? You know, it might be a five by five hanging. They'd rather have a little different kind of artwork. So these were bound in books, but also very valuable in our research because we list names of the people who live there. Same thing, they'd go door to door. They'd ask people their name. Doesn't mean they owned the house. 
Sometimes you'll see the same name over and over. Maybe they did own several houses, but mostly it's who lived there. This little corner of Ewingville in Holyoke. Okay, the bigger overall boundary of the town and then some blow-ups of the populated areas. There were other bound books. You see Richard's Act, Atlas in later time. But Beers is another one of those that exists in a lot of places and at that same time frame. I really like to pair this with an 1870 census. You thought I was going to say a wine, didn't you? If you could line up the 1870 census with these maps from 1870, you can start to understand who's in the neighborhood. And this is something I had done. I was working with our local grammar school and we we're trying to play sort of, where's Waldo? Let's find the house that goes with this name on the census. Or, you know, who had the most children on this page of census? What were the occupations of these people? And then you can look at their occupation with respect to where the businesses might have been right down here by the river. And there's a close up that gives you dames. The women, of course, never had first names, but Mrs. Tuttle lived here. Mrs. Clary lived here. And most everybody else just has an initial. We've got a soup house. We've got a cider bill. We've got a school. So this helps us understand the neighborhood, both with the people and with what was going on there. Here's a little example of that coordination between the census and the map. This is 1870 in um, Agawam, because years ago when I was working with a production of The Miracle Worker, the Helen Keller story, I remember that Annie Sullivan had come from Western Mass. So in the 1870 census, I found her family here. Thomas, his wife, Alice, Anna, Nellie, and James. Remember James, he was disabled. Things didn't go well for him in the orphanage. But the family is not that hard to find in 1870. And we can see the neighbors around them Here's a Taylor, another Taylor family, another Taylor family. So even though we know they were very poor, or we do if we've read a biography, I was wondering if we could feed, uh, find them on the map. So this is the Feeding Hills part of Agawam. Unfortunately, I did find the Taylors and the Moors, some other people that were on that census did not find their name on any of these little squares but just by looking at who else was on that census page, I can estimate that this is where Annie Sullivan lived when she was a little girl. So it was kind of fun. Nothing that had to do with my family, but just something that came into my head when I was thinking about where can we find a little bit of history. So this is another Beers map. We can see the school, the cemetery, etc. cetera, a little bit of topography the water flowing. So once you locate somebody you're looking for in 1870, this is a place to go and hope that they were there when the person knocked on their door who was making this map. I pulled this out of, this was in the Leventhal collection, the Boston Public Library, another great place to find maps. Also a lot of digitized maps. But this was the book that the person, the map maker would have been taking around house to house. Maybe not a map maker, maybe just a salesman. So Mr. Whitefield proposes to publish a view of Dedham Mass as it appeared in 1876, made from original drawings taken by himself. So Mr. Whitefield is the map maker. Don't know if this is Mr. Whitefield's notebook. The size of said view will be from 20 to 35 inches in length and proportional in width. So he's telling you this is another thing you can put on your wall, but it's not five feet wide. So maybe it's a nicer piece of art. 
depending on the number of copies subscribed, it will be lithographed, printed in black with two tints on good plate paper and be furnished to subscribers at the rate of $5 per copy. So he was going door to door and getting people to sign up for this. They wanted to get some money up front before they started producing them because they needed the funds, but they also wanted to know how many they might want to make. So we, the undersized, agree to take this map when he produces it and the number of copies that may be attached to our names here. 200 copies must be subscribed to make it 35 inches. Okay, so it's a little more costly, but he'll upscale it if he gets enough people interested. So this is a little artifact that tells us how that process went on, right? A little later, we get into these beautiful bird's eye views, so-called. Again, no cameras, no birds flying around, no GoPro. And usually there was not a mountain in this place that someone could have actually sat on to figure this out. So this is very artistic. Somebody had to understand what the perspective would look like as we're looking at Holyoke from the river view up above. So this is the type of thing I could definitely see hanging up. You're not gonna roll this up and put it in the drawer. This map is very detailed. Again, imagine them carving this onto a plate in order to print it. Now, in the case of Holyoke on that county wall map, we did not see a lot of this on the perimeter. We saw the blowups of the populated areas. You will often see these in the perimeter of the county maps, which was again, advertising, right? They take a little extra money from people to have their building or whatever they were promoting on the edges. And then you have here a key that describes some of the places here, maybe that were not contributing quite as much to get a full view of the building. We can zoom to say this little outtake Here's a canal labeled with a P is Precious Blood Church. We've got the streets named. Where's another one? Something in the 50s over here. 56 is Grace Chapel. So some of the important things are labeled. I just didn't pull down the entire key. But the interesting thing, or one other interesting thing is generally they were very accurate. When you're looking at these buildings, it probably had that same number of windows. So somebody really took their time to understand what these buildings look like. And we can see multi-story, multi multi-family, some of the industrial buildings, things happening here along the railroad. But if you find either in a directory or in a census that somebody that you're researching lived on an identifiable stretch of street, you may just find what that building could have looked like at the time. So that's a lot of fun. You can zoom in pretty well because they are very detailed. So we get over here, they're smaller houses, possibly single family fewer families anyway than some of these big, taller buildings. And they did make an effort to add a little detail here. You have a horse carriage. Another one over here. Looks like that might be hauling something. Here are a couple examples of the buildings that are on the perimeter there of that one. We have the office, the printing office of the Holyoke Herald. Very cute. Somebody selling a newspaper here. Somebody going by in a carriage. And then one of the bigger plants here. Again, all those windows and that tiny little piece that's off to the side. Looks like we've got the church in the background. People walking, we have a delivery wagon. 
So this gives you a little bit of a flavor of what was going on and the companies that were able to make advertisements. And in the case of the Hampshire County map in the perimeter, this was on the county wall map, was the state hospital there. This tells us it came from a photograph, so it wasn't completely sketched by hand. And it names the superintendent who was there at this time. So that's the kind of thing you may see in the margins, a little added information in addition to those names that we hope we can find. Moving ahead in time, or maybe not so far ahead in time, we have the Sanborn maps. Sanborn maps had been a little difficult to find digitally, but now the Library of Congress is actively digitizing them. So they are definitely available there. They were available in books. I think Eileen has some at the library. And these were issued year after year after year. Because the purpose of this map, again, going back to the beginning, why do these maps exist? These maps were drawn in order to rate the buildings for insurance. So we're not interested in who lives there, we're interested in what the buildings are made of. And here's an example between the river and the third canal of the chemical paper company. So the buildings that show up in pink are made out of brick. The buildings that show up in yellow are made out of wood. There's another code for stone buildings. It's kind of a bluish gray if it's a stone building because that relates to the fire risk, right? And if you know you had an ancestor that worked in a certain department, maybe this gives you a little idea of how big the company was, which end they were, whether there's a chance they could look out a window, not too many of them, but you know, what did they see when they went to work there every day? And there's also a description down in the corner because that's what's important to the insurance company. They have two night watchmen, right? Less chance of somebody dropping a match or maybe the light night watchman dropped a match, but less chance of vandalism or what have you when you have the, the night watchman. The power comes from water and steam, the heat is steam, electric lights. So this helps them decide what the risk is for this building. Now, the purpose was primarily for business, businesses, which were the um, big money coming at the insurance company, but you can also see it for the surrounding streets. So we can see here some brick buildings, some wood buildings, but we can also see if they had a shed in the backyard. You might not know that. You can see if there were multiple buildings. Here we have porches, right? On the edges of this house. So they're trying to decide what the risk is. This over here says blacksmith. So he's working with fire, but it's a pretty secure building. So these are useful, especially in areas where there was industry, you're not going to find these out in the hill towns because there wasn't enough business there to, to warrant making a map. Fancy North Arrow. And these are the water lines because that's also important to the insurance. They want to know if there was water lines in the street and hydrants, how far away to the hydrant. We still do that today, don't we? The insurance, uh, homeowner's insurance wants to know where the nearest hydrant is. USGS maps are often used for hiking. We definitely use them in our land planning to see whether it's sloping up or sloping down. And these are readily available both in paper, but also on the USGS website. It's a little awkward, but you can get these going back many, many years. These have been made for a long time. It's actually better to get the old ones that are in feet because even though they insist we can read meters, I think it's 
most of us are much more comfortable with feet. So this is the Holyoke Quadrangle that covers quite a bit of land. And one thing these are very useful for, do I have a zoom? I do, are looking for cemeteries. Now this is a good sized cemetery in East Hampton, St. Stanislaus under the hill there. But you can find very little cemeteries marked because these are made from aerial photography. And they're zooming in as much as they can and finding these features. So we don't have a, a huge idea of the downtown area, but we see the topography, we see where the mountaintops are. And don't forget to look for cemeteries. Okay, I'm gonna go into my, my nerdy map side and talk about county road layouts. Now remember on those 1830 maps, even on the 1794 maps, they showed county roads. Any road that crosses a town line is a county road. You can't just stop it at the edge of your town, right? It goes from one place to the other. So there's jurisdiction in order to, um, you know, for people to travel from one place to the next. The county commissioners had to approve new roads. They surveyed the roads, so they had them surveyed. And when you go looking for these maps, they can give you information about the people who lived next to the road. So as the road was added or as it modified, we can see angles, but we can also see a butter's names. That's a little tough to read. So this was a little, a road that was laid out in my town, which is now Route 63. 63 goes from Amherst up through Miller's Falls and then north along the New Hampshire side of the Connecticut River. And at this point, it was really, it was needed to get from the train station in Miller's Falls to the northern traffic. There was a covered bridge and a hairpin turn on the other side of town and this straightened things out. But what I also found when I went in looking for this record, now Franklin County legally ceased to exist a few years ago. The county, there are no longer county commissioners. There's no governing body, but we obviously have a county court and we have county records and we have what we call the council of governments that does some governmental functions and they have the records from the county. When you go into their little history room, and I'm not sure how this works down in Springfield, or I have been to the Northampton records, but you sign in because like many historic libraries, they wanna know who's there if something comes up missing, right? But you sign in and you're gonna say the names of maybe two surveyors who have been there in the last couple months. So my name's in the book and you can go through the book and you can get used to their filing system. And they have both the books of maps organized by location and they have the county commissioners, the proceedings, the votes and that type of thing. And when I was in there looking for this road layout for another project, the fellow who's in charge of, what would you say? Well, welcoming people into the room or overseeing the room. Somebody has to be in charge. He said, there's probably more information in the box in the basement. So I said, Bob, Bob, could you take a look in the basement for me and see what else you have? Because this road was going through land here of Leroy Weatherhead that I was interested in. And what he came up with out of that box was this. This is the petition to lay out that road. So the citizens of Franklin County respectfully requ represent that their the public convenience requires a laying out of this road. Leading from Grout's Corner, which is what Miller's Falls was called at the time, to Northfield. Touching and Irving, intersect with the present highway, everything was a highway, at the mouth of the Miller's River. But on this letter, and I like displaying it when I do this in, perma, in, in person because it is about three feet long. Everybody who is everybody signed this request. 
And there are, I think, over 100 signatures. So if you're looking for anybody who lived in the general area at that time, you're going to find their signature. And that's always fun, right? It's a little bit like finding a photograph sometimes. Again, my engineering side of my brain says when we're talking about maps, we should talk about individual surveys. I pulled this out because it's interesting. It's got a lot of features. It has a stream. It has some roads. It has an orchard. We have the names of the neighbors. We'll get into this a lot more next time. Because a lot of times we want to know who lived next door. Did they marry the girl next door? This is actually in Concord. I don't know John Moon, but look who surveyed it in 1853, Henry D. Thoreau. So when he wasn't sitting by the pond and thinking great thoughts, he was a surveyor. So this one's got some interest both for what you see in the land and who draw, drew it. Okay, this is really nerdy, but this is one of my favorite unknown sources. In the early 1900s, these books were made that summarized the boundary lines of every town in Massachusetts. I want to say random, not completely random. All these towns are contiguous, right? But almost all of them touch into three counties. So they didn't try to do it county by county. Somebody grabbed a bunch of towns and put them all together into a blob. So you can see the Holyoke is with Northampton, but they're also with a lot of the smaller towns going off to the west, as well as West Springfield. But then we have Hatfield and Huntington, Southwick and Williamsburg. Okay, so you have to look a little to figure out where your town is. Now you will find inside so many different pages. This one describes how each town was uh, defined by the legislature. So Holyoke, chapter 71, Acts of 1850. So if we wanted to go and find who signed it, who voted on it, something more at the state archives, maybe there's some debate listed. But we're told that Holyoke was formed out of part of West Springfield that lay north of a line connecting the mouth of the Riley Brook with the Westfield line and incorporated as the town of Holyoke. Okay, so this is a good quick reference other than Google if you want to know when and how the town was separated. Because again, when we're looking for people, we need to know where their records might have been stored. And if Holyoke didn't exist until 1850, we don't want to go to City Hall in Holyoke. We can also see that it became a city in 1873. And Northampton, south of Mount Tom, was annexed in 1909. Okay, so this is going to tell you in words how the boundaries changed and similar for the other towns. It's also going to tell you what those lines are between each city or town. Okay, if we want to find the boundary line between Holyoke and South Hadley, we're going to find the corner where Hadley, Holyoke, and South Hadley all come together, which happens to be a point in the middle of the Connecticut River. It's about 700 feet from the witness mark. A witness mark is something that is placed on dry land to give you an idea where the line is gonna be if you connected the dots. Okay, it's a granite monument marked with a SH for South Hadley, situated in open meadow 100 feet north from the bank of the river. So in the old days, the selectmen were supposed to go out and perambulate these lines, right? Every five years, every three years. I don't think it happens too much anymore. And when the river is the boundary, you're not too concerned about where the middle happens to be. But you can actually go and look for those markers. I don't know if anybody here has done that before. 
Okay, same thing between Holyoke and Westfield, Holyoke and West Springfield. This book, in this book, you can find the definition of those lines. And you can find pictures of those lines. So over here, we can see this is the witness mark. And South Hadley, or Hadley and South Hadley, Holyoke here. And it says that from this witness mark, the actual boundary line in the middle of the river is so many feet at this angle. At the time this was made, we had pasture, we had pasture. So this gives you an idea of how to find it. Now, if you go looking for these corners, as I did, I took a look at the little of the map, the description, tried to figure out where these roads are now as they were described before. Okay, junction of wire fences. Chances are the wire fences aren't there anymore. But it's a split granite marker with E for Irving. I think Phil is in the audience, isn't he? So he gets a photo credit. This is the boundary between Irving and Orange, which is the Miller's River. So these witness mark, witness markers are on either side of the river. If you connect the dots, that's where the boundary is. Does this make you happy? I just love the way this looks. This helps you imagine that there were people standing on these tall points and looking around them and measuring. So all the little triangles come together and help the map be as accurate as it possibly can. Okay, I told you, really nerdy. And the book describes where these reference points may be. Okay, a drill hole in a sandstone outcropping at a ridge separating the Connecticut Valley from the Deerfield River Valley. Okay, how do you know that? It's the Pocumptuck Rock. Now, we may have, we've seen maybe when we're hiking those USGS metal discs but this is a uh, carved square put into the granite of the hilltop. But the, the intent here is that they can be reproduced so nobody lose their t loses their town boundary. And they tell you the distances and the dimensions between all these things, between Turkey Hill and the Springfield, you know, things that they think will last. Some of them are church steeples that they hope will last. That's not a given. And there's always that outside chance that one of these town lines went right through your ancestor's land. This comes out of the book that described the town of Ashby in Middlesex County as it was taken out of the town of Ashburnham, mostly also part of Fitchburg. Okay, in 1767, this line was drawn from the corner of James Coleman's second division, lot number 18. So this is gonna be in one of those old grid maps. And it totally coincidentally, as I was flipping through one of these maps, because why not open the book if you see it on a shelf, right? And there was my ancestor. So that was pretty cool for me. I wrote a little how-to if you end up finding these books or downloading these books, I'd be happy to send you a copy because there is so much in there. Wrapping up, how are we doing? Pretty good. Where do we find the old maps? There are old maps, obviously, in the Holyoke Library. But because many things are digital, not all things are digital, we can find them on the website of the State Archives the David Rumsey collection, he shares things really freely. He has a wonderful collection and he's perfectly happy to have you download them. Library of Congress, you can find many different collections at university libraries, sometimes from other places that you wouldn't expect. And you can find those surveys or those road layouts at the Registry of Deeds. Just as they have books and page for deeds, they have books and pages for maps. Be happy to hear when we go to questions if you found any interesting maps in other places, like your attic. 
this just highlights the digitization process that's happening at the State Archives. Those books can be found there. The Beers maps. I think the county maps are more likely at the Library of Congress, but Google is your friend. Library of Congress, loc.gov slash maps. And you can download all kinds of things. They are, as I said, actively digitizing Sanborn maps. They must have recently gone out of copyright or somebody had bought them. They were used a lot for hazardous material studies, finding out where the old factories used to be to try to determine if they had some liability today. So somebody had the market captured on that, but Library of Congress has got them now. If they're not there today, they may be there tomorrow. So again, I urge you to think about these guys that were out there measuring things in the heat, in the cold, like the mailman, under dark of night. But somebody had to do this, and because they did, we have the benefit of their work today. So I hope I've given you some ideas and some thoughts about why you might be looking harder for some maps when you're doing your historical research in the future. That's my email address right there if you want to contact me afterwards, but I'd be happy to take questions now if there's anything you'd like to talk about some more. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I have to say this, this answered a lot of questions that I had and it answered quite a few questions that I didn't know I had. So um, that was great. And I like, um, I like that you started kind of at, at, at the beginning of map making uh, for uh, North America. Um, but before we go into questions, we're getting a lot of uh, complimentary chats here. Um, I had one thing to add about the, the walling map in 1855, and I know that you're not immersed in Holyoke history, um, but that walling map is actually not accurate, I realized, based on the plan of Holyoke, looks very similar oh, okay. to the plan of Holyoke, which was published in 1853, and so, for instance, it shows the canals as if they were completed by 1855. Mm. And I'm okay. pretty sure somebody here can correct me, but I'm pretty sure the canals were not actually completed until the 1890s. They took that long to construct and they changed a little bit from the plan. So Holyoke's really unusual in that way in that um, most towns in Massachusetts grew organically, even cities. You know, Springfield was an old colonial right. uh, town and then it grew organically. Holyoke was a planned industrial city. And, and that makes map making a little bit different. Um, so those early maps, you'll see, well, early maps of West Springfield would be similar to what you'd find elsewhere. But once mm -hmm. you get to Holyoke maps, you have to look at it and say, is this really Holyoke or is this what they hoped for? In mm -hmm. So true. So I wanna let somebody else ask some questions though. I know there were there were questions about where to get the maps, and you covered that. I wanted to add to that uh, the Boston Public Library has some right? the Leventhal Map Center. Now, two of the maps for Holyoke three maybe that you mentioned are on our website. So if you go to History Room and Digital Collections, we our go to maps are the. The Richards Atlas from 1911, which I think you're going to talk about last time. So there's a huge PDF up there of that one. The George Walker Atlas for 1884, which we also use all the time. We tend to use these to date houses when people are interested in their in their houses. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think those are the main two that I want to point out. Oh, we rely heavily on the Library of Congress for our sand which seem for Holyoke, I don't, I think they can only do the ones uh, pre-1924. So we found them up till 1915 on the Library of Congress, nothing later than that. And we have the 1940s in the history room. And I don't know if that will go online anytime soon. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I've seen some that were updated. Maybe it was a Richards in Greenfield in the vault where they just glued the new section on top, which makes you crazy. <laughs> that, you exactly. You do not get the snapshot in time at right, all. So right. that's why I was hedging about the 1940s because it's actually 1940s right into the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So all these paste overs. Um, yeah, because that's, that's the way that they were used. So let's see. Oh, there is a question in here, and I can. Tom, can I? You want to unmute yourself and ask your question? We get some voice. Sure. Hi, Tom. Sounds like you're on. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Oh, he looks frozen. All right. I'm going to ask this question because I think Tom is frozen. So he wanted to know if um, any of the 1794 and 1830 maps show the name of the person or firm that drew the map. And was it usually the surveyors who drew the map? That's a good question because the towns had to submit them. I would think you might find it in the um, town meeting minutes or something like that that authorized the spending of the money. I can't think that I've seen a name on them, but I could be wrong. But good question, because you'd like to know who was doing it. Were they doing a lot of towns? You know, were they using people in town or were people traveling to do it? That's a good question. Tom, your mouth is moving and now you're muted again. Sorry, I was disconnected from the internet for a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, did you hear the other part about did the surveyors often draw the maps themselves? Yeah, I would say that they were probably producing it on linen and not paper. A lot of things that were older were, come, were on tr um, coated linen to last longer. So I don't think they had... Um, who else would help them out? Nobody in town because they just wanted it to happen because they had to do it. And then when we get into the map making, you know, the printing side of it, then they have the lithographers and the, the you know, people who scratch the plates to make it look like it, it looked, but that's very artistic. You don't know where the surveyors came from. Were they government employees or private? I think it would be interesting to try to find out what was happening at that time and see how they let a contract. I bet we could go back into town minutes in that period and figure it out. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So Glenn, you have a question? Go ahead. Uh, or just an aside, can you hear me? Sure. We can. Good. <laughs> very good. Uh, very good job. Thank you. Uh, in town, there's a woman, Helene Florio, who's a descendant of the architect who did quite a bit here, George P.B. Alderman. And when I asked her if she or anyone in her family had any of the original work, whatever, she said some female ancestor of hers washed all the linen <laughs> that had all the George P.B. Alderman architectural designs on it. So when you just said that, I, I thought of that and I was just like, oh, why did she do that? But <laughs> Hadn't heard that one. A lot, a lot, of, lot of work and a lot of, uh, a lot of great history there that was washed away. Wow. We do have, we do have um, a photocopy of some of, um, of Alderman's records. So we can tell when some of those houses were built and for whom. It's a little hard to match up. I haven't looked at it in a while, but I think it doesn't have, might not have the addresses as we, as they're numbered now. So it's a little hard to match up, but we do have that record. Right. And, and just another aside, and this is maybe off topic, I'm sorry. The uh, city engineers, or I, I'm trying to remember if it was any annex, city hall, and I remember Jim Sheehan on the Historic Commission had gone in there and made himself ill with all the dust. 
And um, I believe that's a treasure trove of stuff. And I can't remember if I dreamt it recently or if they're moving everything out of that office. And you can, I hope somebody gets on it and they don't throw these things away. Yeah, um, Damien, was Penny and I, Penny from um, Mystery Hearst and I were in touch with Damien a few years ago about that collection uh, a number of times. So I'll follow up with him, Glenn, because maybe something is changing now. And they Thank haven't you. contacted us this time. They contacted, contacted us in the past. So yeah, thanks. But I have a talk I call Secrets of My Vault because when I went to work for DPW in Greenfield, right above the clerk's vault downstairs is the DPW vault. And there were things in there like the surveyor's notes for, you know, a hundred years, all the little yellow books and um, water connection permits, things you could find elsewhere like the um, annual reports and things like that. But I just had such a good time. I just wanted to spend all my time in the vault. Old pictures, things like that. I mean, if you're dating a house, sometimes you can find out when the water was connected. And that could be an indication of when it was built. So it's not something that a lot of people think about going to DPW. But it's enough of a novelty, unlike when you go to the clerk and they say, oh, not another genealogist. Um, sometimes DPW can get into it, so, you know, let's, let's dig in here, let's answer this question. So it's, it's sometimes a, a fun place to try, but people that don't have my frame of mind don't always think of that. City Hall does have those records in Holyoke for when the water was turned on. Yeah. They're very useful. City, City Hall or the water department? The, uh, I'm pretty sure it's in City Hall. Yeah, I know the water department, I had a temporary job there, uh, 91, 92, and they were trying to digitize them all. So they had a card catalog, like the oh, library, yeah. alf alphabetize okay. it. And you'd go in Allen Street. And uh, actually, I, prior to COVID, I was going in there, whatever houses I was looking at, and they were letting me photograph a couple. The gal was very nice. Mm -hmm. I was nice to her. So that's usually the, the first place to look at the water department. But I did not know that they have those well, records. Well, no, City Hall I also. I haven't used them, Glenn, so um, you're, I would go to the water department first, um, but I've been, you know, I've been told to send people to the water department, and they've had some success, so yes, yeah, yeah. yeah that's what I would do. And, and that was 91, 92, uh, 30 years ago. Have they digitized them yet? <laughs> I haven't seen a sign of that, no. have yeah. not in Greenfield, I'll tell you. Yeah. So, Sarah, one thing I wanted to ask about... Um, Let's see. Oh, the, the Beers Atlas. You know how it showed some of the homeowners, right? You, you zoomed in and, but how did they decide? Do you think that was just convenience or um, because they, they could map those, those areas of town and they were able to show those people because they were far enough apart? Because Holyoke in 1870 had more than 10,000 people. Mm. Um, and now, granted, not all of those people own property, but I don't think all the property owners are listed, unlike in the 1911 map, where pretty much every property and property owner is shown. I think maybe we have to go back to how many books could they sell. You know, the people who were living in the tenements were not about to buy a map. So they would, it was both the more congested area, but also the less likely to be uh, conducive to selling books down there as well. So I think, you know, on the one hand, they were trying to, to make an accurate representation, but on the other side, they were selling the books. Right, and, and tenement dwellers are never listed on this map, only, only the tenement owner mm -hmm. on these. And the other thing about, just a caveat on some, even the later fire insurance maps will not map the rural areas of town uh, for the reasons that you described, that they're, they're not selling fire insurance out there. Uh, they're not rating those homes as much. So uh, sometimes only the congested areas, the industrial areas are mapped. Laurel's asking about UMass, and I'm trying to remember if I've, I've been in an archive several times, but I don't remember looking for maps at the time. That's a good question. Oh, Laurel, if you want to un unmute yourself. You see it. Okay, can you hear me now? 
Okay. The, re the reason I mentioned it is I worked um, for a few years at UMass in the, um, what really, it wasn't the physical sciences library, it was in moral library, a moral building, which happened to house um, professors who were geologists, they were the geology people. And at the time they had a, a contract with the USGS and I personally had, knew a lot of people that literally walked every foot of um, this, of that area in order to map, you know, outcroppings of stone. And I mean, they were incredibly detailed. It took forever. But um, the reason I mentioned this is it suddenly brought to mind the fact that they have a whole map room there and it is not all um, sciences. Uh, they, they, they're just, they house all of the maps that they have. And a friend of mine was the um, librarian for that. So I was just curious because, you know, despite working there, I never thought about, you know, I was just starting my geological, my uh, genealogy journey. So I never thought about looking at maps and it was right there. Um, so I just wanted to sort of mention it, but it's a good way to access if, if anyone has a reason to do it, the USGS maps without having to go out and buy them. Oh, Sarah, sure, you're muted. Am I muted again? I un No, I was, there we go. Okay. Um, that I think was the only place to get that colored geological map. And that may be a lot of what you're talking about too. That's, that shows the various, you know, what's under what and the, yep. the places it comes out because those were hard to come by. Yeah, yeah. Dale says $5 for a map would now be about $125 comparing $1870. So buying a couple, that was a real splurge. But what an investment. You see what people purchase them for now. <laughs> Sarah? Yes. Yeah. Uh, have you ever looked at online uh, modern day mapping tool that Massachusetts has. It's called Oliver. Um, it's a US, USGS online mapping tool that's really handy. And you can even, there's all different layers you can put it, put down, including the, the top of topographic. Um, I used it recently, but <clears throat> it's a good way to get to the, the topo maps. The other one too, within it's not just Google Maps, it's Google Earth, where mm -hmm. you can slide a historic map, uh, make it more or less transparent and try to overlay on mm -hmm. that. Louisa Louise, Lisa Louise Cook does a great um, uh, description of that. I think she's it's on her YouTube channel. And I keep saying, I've seen it several times and I need to go back and do it again and I always forget to look at it, but you can pick a year with a map that's that's digitized in there and overlay it with a modern map, which is pretty cool. I also wanted to ask you, do your research ever take you to aerial photographs? You ever look for those? Not lately. I did actually, I have the little goggles that, you know, you look through for 3D aerial photo uh, mm -hmm. interpretation that mm -hmm. I, I had from graduate school and you can see the, the you know, start sharper V's and smoother valleys and that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, and again, you know, use them in topography and surveying several years ago because that's what they do. They computerize the, the topo lines, even on a, a smaller project. Yeah, U UMass has a collection including uh, one, photos from years ago, mm. you know, like 1952 is one that comes to mind. And I think older than that too, but you can see a lot on those mm -hmm. aerial photographs. History I have history. one more question if, Go ahead. okay. So um, I love these maps and um, what I'm curious about is, um, the level of accuracy in them because I actually, oddly enough, I had an English professor at Holyoke Community 
you probably know him, Glenn, but <laughs> um, he, I, I don't remember what we were studying at the time, but they are in, it ended up launching into this big discussion discussion about maps. And his, he had inherited a parcel of land in Southern Vermont. And um, in order for the family to, to sell and divide up the proceeds, you know, after this relative died, they had it surveyed and were stunned to find out it was 50 acres larger than they, you know, that they, than they knew. And of course that was all good news, but, um, you know, it just made me really wonder about, you know, because it seems like they put all the time into it and, and measurements and all, and how often that really could have happened. Well, we'll do more of that next time. How's that for an answer? Okay, I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> because this, um, yeah, I know some of those beers maps show the rectangles around the house as well, but I'm guessing that would just be based on whether they had assessor's maps or whatever at that time. Um, yeah, lots of different levels, but these where they show owners, it was really asking the question, knocking on the door. So if they gave the wrong name or made something up, um, <laughs> I guess they could have been put down on the map with really without understanding where the, the lot lines were, but the um, discussion about the actual city lines, those had to be pretty accurate because they were then putting in those granite markers and they, what you call written in stone, right? Yeah, yes. Well, Sarah, thank you again. This has been great. And I hope we'll see some of you on the, on the ninth um, or you can let others know who might be interested and jumping into land records. And in, as you said, Sarah, maybe some of the other maps we'll look at more closely mm -hmm. next time. Mm -hmm.